The Ryan and Russ Show is brought to you by Vision Homes. If you're looking to build a home in North Central West Virginia, visit askvisionhomes.com. Vision Homes, building you a house you're proud to call home. And don't forget to subscribe to The Ryan and Russ Show, but don't take our word for it. Take Coach Neelan's. Hi, this is Coach Don Neelan, and you're watching The Ryan and Russ Show. Please subscribe. And we welcome you into another edition of the Ryan and Russ Show, your source for West Virginia sports. On today's episode, we have a special guest that we'll uh, talk to at the end of the show. We, of course, want to give a shout out to Jay Jacobs and his last call. Uh, but unfortunately, we begin with a game where the score didn't really indicate it. Uh, West Virginia falls to BYU 86-73, a game that was close the whole time, Ryan. We talked about it. You can't fall asleep at the wheel. I think the biggest issue was the last two minutes of the first half, first two minutes of the second half, played a little slow, played a little lackadaisical, and next thing you know, BYU shoots a couple threes, and you're down nine points. Yeah, it, it was definitely a frustrating missed opportunity, like you said, Rush. It, BYU's really good. If you give them open shots, they're, they're going to make them. That, that's why they're averaging more than 10 a game. They shoot basically 40 a game, which we talked about in the pregame and preview, and they shot 36 and made 30, 13 of them. So if they're going to make 13 on 36 attempts, it's going to be tough to beat them. They were good inside as well, but really you look at that stretch at the end of the first half, the beginning of the second half, that really was the tail of the game where they were able to stretch it from about a tie game, two-point game into a 13, 14, I think even at 1.16. And then we were able to get things going, get some stops, but – just some backbreaker, whether it was BYU banking in the three on an out of bounds play, an offensive foul. It just, it was, it, it, it was, it just, it, we weren't there on, on Saturday night. We, we, whenever we'd get it to five, six points, BYU would make a play. And you got to give them credit, man. They're old. They, uh, they've been on the short end of some of these uh, games in the Big 12 on the road. And I think that maybe the, the fourth, fifth game now for them being in this league helped them get over the hump finally in league play. Yeah, we'll talk about this BYU team on the latter half of the podcast um, a little more, especially with Big 12. We're about that halfway point in the Big 12 season and kind of wanted to start as we go into this tournament, uh, Big 12 tournament. Obviously, West Virginia could be playing anyone. We'll see what the final rankings are. But obviously, March Madness is a great time of year, and I think it's when we all start to cheer for the Big 12. So we'll start kind of diving into these other teams amongst the Big 12 and catch everyone out. Obviously, storyline two, uh, the Egyptian magician Khalifa was out this game. He was sick. I don't know if he'll be playing in the Oklahoma game if he's able to fly out to Norman. Uh, Waterman, too, also zero points, but he was feeling ill as well. But, you know, you need bodies out there. Ryan, you mentioned it with this BYU team. They're an older team, and they're adapting well uh, to the Big 12. Something interesting you talk about with the three-point lines. I have the stats pulled up here. So, you, you kind of compare the stats for the game, right? Rebounds, 35 a pair. Uh, points off a turnover, BYU had 11. We had nine, you know, about the same. Turnovers themselves, nine to eight. Uh, same amount of free throws. But you you, you look at the three-point uh, line, and this is where BYU excels. It's it's where they're very good, and it's we, we talked about it is if you're coming out of timeouts, toward, you know, it's the, the half's winding down, the half starts, and you kind of fall into that slow groove. BYU is just going to all of a sudden, you went from this being a three point, three, four point halftime game, then all of a sudden you're down nine. And you you, you can't do that with this team. Uh, we, we saw it a couple times, the Kansas State game, for example. Uh, we, you know, we would get up, go on a hot streak. Tang would call a timeout. And the next thing you know, Kansas State puts up four points. And it's like we're now in a hole again. So something this West Virginia team has trying to work towards is having all these guys back. And you know what's going to happen? It's Big 12 play. You're going to get into some holes sometimes, but it's about digging yourself out of these holes. Holes. I know it's tough. You're still playing for pride. Um, another thing Josh mentioned at the the, the post game, he's talking about this BYU team, and you know you're you're going to have this where teams can do multiple things well. BYU is getting better at driving the basketball. Uh, obviously, they're very good at three pointers, but sometimes you have to pick your poison um, and eliminate what you think's going to be their their best asset. Right? We talk about it. Uh, a lot with with football, right? B this was big Belichick's thing. We're going to just take away your number one, beat us with your number two and three. And I think when you play these teams, especially these older teams, it, it's harder to do that. But going back to what we were talking about, a game where, where the store, score wasn't an indication, but hey, th this this Mountaineer team, they did show, I don't think it was all negatives either. This Mountaineer team did show fight. They could have, you know, felt when they were down double digits, they could have lost by 20. 
25, they kept grinding. And unfortunately, you couldn't get out of that that hole that's really hard to get out of, especially in the Big 12. Yeah, and to keep in perspective for West Virginia fans, this is a – you know who they remind me of, Rush? Remember Fred Hoiberg's Iowa State teams where they would spread oh, you yeah. out with five guys that can make shots? That's who, And they had one guy inside that, that could post up and they could play inside out. That's who they remind me of is Iowa State – during the mayor's days and I BYU is a team where if they get the right draw, they can go to the second weekend of the tournament, especially with their unique style of play. And another stat that really kind of reflected how good they were on, on Saturday night, they had 32 made made field goals. 19 of them had an assist on it. So they kind of, we, we talked about it. We had to guard the basketball because they're really good at creating mismatches and beating you off the bounce and not so much to, to score at the rim, but to draw help and then kick it out and, and put you in rotations. And then um, they, they a couple of those threes at the end of the first half were off offensive rebounds, which we also talked about mm-hmm. that a couple threes, wide open threes, easy ones is off, off offensive rebounds. So they, it was tied at 25 and they were able to go on like a 31, 14 runner, 32, 15 to extend that thing to a, a 17 point lead. And that ultimately was too much for this Mountaineer team. Russ, you do make a good point. I thought that we could have quit. I mean, it, it's deflating when BYU is making three after three after three, but we did fight. We got it down to five. Noah's offensive foul was an absolute back, backbreaker. Quinn missed some pretty open ones. Yeah. I missed some open ones. Raekwon missed some open ones that we just couldn't get over the hump. The, the hole was too big. But you, like you said, the team kept fighting. Um, and and they had a chance there for a minute, but it, you can't dig yourself in a 17 point hole in this league. I mean, 10 points is about max you can come back from. And we, we were able to do that last week against Cincinnati, but not, 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 not the case this time, man. I know we've talked about it time after time, and this is how Mountaineer nation feels really wish we had this full team to start the season. I think this is a different game. I actually yeah. think we match up. We did pretty well against BYU. I mean, I, I, when you, when you ignore kind of everything that happened, leading up to this game. And if you were to just take this game as a sample size, to me, this felt like two pretty, pretty evenly matched teams. And we yeah. obviously know how well BYU is doing, um, you know, it, but Hey, there's still, there's still a lot of season left. We talk about it We're from the West Virginia side of things. Yeah. Maybe March madness isn't on the table. You're going to have to win the big 12 tournament. NIT. Mm, they got to get, hot. maybe they got to they gotta they get, get hot. Like but, but, but this goes to our point that we talked about is yeah. Maybe we're not going to be that team that makes it in March but we could also be that team that no one wants to play leading yeah. up into March too. So obviously working on that, a couple other notes I took uh, from this game, because this game did start out. Obviously we knew the threes were going to come for BYU. Uh, th- this is kind of a common theme we see, especially in our losses, Ryan is whatever a team's really good at, or even just being on the road in general. And they kind of start to you know play a little flat or not do as well as, they should be in an area they're good at. For good example, BYU is good at shooting threes. We need to do a better job of taking advantage of that. Game started out. BYU, you know, wasn't getting them. Crowd was into it. You got to find opportunities to score a little more. And that also, you know, talking about Jesse Edwards, got in a little bit of foul trouble early. Obviously, we need him. We're a completely different team with him on the court. Just, you know, obviously with his size and what he brings, but also he gives us some life. He, he He's great out there. So, you know, he can't obviously get in foul trouble. We've had enough of this season where he's he's on the bench. You need to, need to keep him out there. The story might yeah. be a little bit different. He doesn't get in foul trouble. And then obviously a cook not playing. Uh, Josh didn't talk about it much in his uh, post-game interview. Just said it was medical. Um, but I'd be curious to see what it would have been like if he would have been out there. But, hey, you know, very disappointing, especially where we are in the season. Um, uh, I don't mean to be a dead horse, but not, the score is not an indication of the game. But this is... This is a talented team. Even Mark Pope talked about it. West Virginia's a good team with great individuals. When we play like a team, make that extra passes, great things happen. Um, but it's just too little, too late. Yeah, and it, it sucks to lose a home game. That's that that's of course. The, that's the big thing that really hurts is you had a chance to get back to four and five and and get back in the in the middle of things. The, the leader in the Big 12 is at six and three. Obviously, Houston and Kansas are a step up from us talent wise. And, and and just roster breakdown. But if, if you had won that game, you, you're back in the thick of things, maybe to get a buy in the in the tournament. Because with it now being 14, uh, I want to say the fir- the top four will get a buy. Maybe it's top five. Two. They go to the quarterfinals. I think. I think the two. 
Yeah, you you probably are right. Yeah, there's like a first four, and then like yeah. the meat of it, and then like however it comes out, you line up with the top four. Yeah, yeah, three versus fourteen. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like be the, the first year. That'll be the first year of this new format, unless they're doing double buys. I haven't seen the bracket yet. Are I they, think doing they are double doing double buys? That's what I'm saying. I think the top four teams are automatically in the quarterfinals. I think oh, you have okay, like okay. a okay, you have yeah. like a first four, yeah. and then those first whoever comes out like of those the old, line like up. the old Big East, like the old Big East, kind of yeah. like the way the ACC does it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, my I'm guess saying, is when we go to 16 teams, it'll be exactly like the ACC in their tournament. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, top four get a buy or double buy, then five through eight get the single buy, mm -hmm. and then nine through 14 are playing on uh, the opening night Wednesday night. So yeah, we're talking is, about yeah. you want to get somehow if you can get into the top eight, taking a game off of that that stretch that we're we're talking about that you got to do. Obviously, the, the odds are stacked against you. You're going to have to beat three to four top 15 to 20 teams. That's already hard enough. Having to play an additional game is another animal. So sure. um, it would be nice to be able to get in the top eight or one back of that. So the, but there's a lot of basketball to be played and it sucks because now you're three and six and you got to hit the road against Texas. Who's playing as good as anybody in the league and TCU. Who's we've always struggled there on that, that uh, messed up, uh, rubber court of theirs <laughs> everyone's yeah. favorite their their yeah. rubber court just looks absolutely beautiful on tv like boise state's uh yep. football field ryan so we have a bye week this week mm -hmm. um josh eilert said it was it's time for a bye week need it clear the mind out where do we go from here i mean you obviously you've been you've been in the locker room you you've been this has been your job in the past it, a little unusual to have a bye week obviously we would usually yeah. be playing the sec big 12 challenge locker room standpoint coaching staff standpoint what do you do during this bye week to to get ready to play an opponent like texas in texas a team we did beat and who knows texas the way they kind of work if they beat iowa state this week they tend to win two lose two win two. they they're, they're a beatable team even in austin i'm not saying it won't be hard but maybe you get a, a road win in austin and then that's kind of that february spark we're talking about yeah th this this should be a game where you are the you're playing harder than Texas because you have the rest. BYU had the rest against us. I think you could tell that they were fresher coming into the game. They had more legs, more pop in their step out of the gate. So I, the way they're going to approach it probably today, Sunday was off. Uh, today was off. Tuesday will probably be some skill development stuff, individuals, and then they'll probably do a three-day uh, practice, what, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday headed into – because at the same time you got a quick turn with TCU, so you can't mm -hmm. you can't you can't burn these guys' legs. So take advantage, get fresh. Um, sometimes in the past, when we had more time to prepare, I thought we over prepared, and so sure. I, I and I and I know Josh agrees with this philosophy. Is it was more about just us doing our principles, playing to our identity, with especially during the Press Virginia era. The, 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 that's all that that's all we were. And that's, that's why we won so many games is it didn't matter what you were going to try and do. You're, you were going to have to adjust to us. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to have to adjust to you because of how dominant and intimidating our style of play was. So I would say that they're probably going to keep it somewhat normal in preparation standpoint, but probably more individual, just get some shots so that we're, we're making shots headed into this Texas two-step trip because you, you don't need to over-prepare when you, when you got TCU right on the back end of this as well, because it's a quick turn uh, Saturday, yeah. Monday trip. And quick turns may not be a bad thing. You got to at least split one of those of the, yep. of the Texas two step. Uh, let, let me ask you this too, Ryan. Um, besides Jesse Edwards, because I mean, I think that's the obvious. Remember, we were always joking last year that Eb, Eric Stevenson was our X factor. I think we can say that Jesse Edwards is now officially the X factor for the rest of the season. But what's a, who's a player you would like to, to step up a little more that we kind of, you know, obviously a lot of players on this team that have potential, but one that's kind of like, Hey, we, we need to get a little more out of you. It's gotta be Raekwon, right? I, I mean, Ray, Raekwon, what did he finish from the field the other night? He finished, uh, Raekwon finished five for 15 for 14 yeah. points. That's, that's not an efficient night for him. And he's 20 at least. I, I think he's pressing. I think he's still used to being at the top of the scouting report. Um, He's not playing efficient at all right now. Too too many field goal attempts, not enough, uh, not enough production. Um, Cincinnati the other night, he he kind of struggled as well. I, I the Kansas game was the perfect game for him. Twenty three points on fourteen shots. That was an efficient 
game for him. Texas, he was pretty good as well, 14 points on 10 shots. So that's kind of the recipe. I think I, you could argue Quinn also. Quinn can be up and down, especially with his emotions. But Raekwon's a different animal where I feel like he should be able to rip off a 6 to 8 point Eight, six to eight oh run by himself in a game Absolutely. we just haven't seen that because I, I don't know if he if his legs are gone a little bit right now maybe the bye week does wonders for him but he's the guy that's got to take his game from right here to here like we expected when we mm -hmm. when we were vouching for the waiver i mean he yeah. he's supposed to be our guy scoring the basketball and he's still getting used to being the top guy on the sky report against these really good defenses everybody in the top 25 from the defensive metrics and the coaching is so good, but he's got, he's got to match it. I mean, that's why he came to play in this league. It's the best league in America. He wants to be a professional. You got You got to match uh, your opponent's intensity and you got to find a way to get it done. Well, you make another good point too. A lot of these players obviously may not be the NBA, but beyond pride you're playing for, you're playing for contracts over seats. I mean, you're playing for the ability to have an amazing job and play basketball as your career. So you know, it, it's maybe not playing for, for March Madness, but there are a lot of other things to play for. And you never know what happens um, with that hap when that can happen. Um, anyway, moving on, the comments section is alive and well. We have Timothy Green in, of course. How's How you doing, Timothy? I have a question. Who do you guys will think will win the NCAA basketball championship this year? I'm sure, we'll have a lot of videos coming up on that, but let's do a quick one. Who do you think, Ryan? Um, If you put a gun to my head right now, I would probably say... Purdue. Purdue. I like yeah. I like that angle, losing to a 16 yeah. seed like Virginia coming back and winning. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go Houston. I think Houston. Kansas wins the Big 12, but Houston wins it all. I think actually being in the Big 12 now prepares Houston to get over that uh, March Madness hump. But, hey, that's that's why they play it. Both those teams could be out the first game of the season, our yeah. first game of March Madness. So it's funny how that happens. Matthew says, what's up, boys? Crush and loss. At least we have some name to rest and prepare for Texas. Hopefully the time off doesn't affect how we play on Saturday. Well, hopefully it affects it in a good way, but I know what you're saying, Matt. Ryan knows what you're saying. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's great. Like you have that Saturday loss, right? And you quickly have big Monday. You don't have time to process it. You get things right. But this one, you know, sticks with you for a bit. So we'll, we'll see how they adjust. Just as a reminder, we have a special guest at the end of this episode, which will, who we'll get to in a second. He's back in the waiting room. But before we do that, we got to give a shout out uh, to someone special that made their last call in this BYU game. Jay Jacobs. We saw him before the game. Ryan shook his hand. Uh, did a great job with the call. Just like getting right back on a bike, right? Just went right into the mode. Yeah. Uh, we were fortunate enough to to go to his after party at Club 35 and pay tribute to him, get some good pictures with him and just thank him for all he's done for, for Mountaineer Nation. I mean, from a player, from an announcer, just on so many levels. Uh, Ryan, obviously you, you, you're really close to Jay. You guys catch up often. Um, you've used to work with him. Your, your thoughts on honoring former Ryan and Rush guest, uh, Jay Jacobs, which is a great episode, by the way. Go check that out um, in yeah. our interview section if you get the opportunity. But, Ryan, what, what your tribute to Jay Jacobs? Yeah, man, he's 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 the best. It's it, it, How impressive was it that he was able to just not have his – I mean, you got to train your vocals to be able to do a college basketball game at a high level. It, with, with the crowd, a lot going on. He, him being as old as he is, 80, 83 years young, um, able to just go like, like it's riding a bike. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. that's so underrated how impressive that was. But just a icon in the in the in the community, whether it was his announcing career, uh, obviously he played with Jerry West, um, and, and he was the all time leading scorer at Morgantown High before recently when Tron Young uh, broke his record. So Jay's right. now number two. Um, I remember he, he that. Always, he always joked that he would be that he, he hoped he would be dead before somebody broke his record. So he didn't get that done. Uh, shout out to Sharon Young, who's going to be an accurate zip. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had a great career. Uh, obviously, him and Hugs are, are very close, and, and 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 Tony as well. And the that radio show that they did was the best radio show in the country it would it be incredible. because they would do everything but talk about basketball and <laughs> they just, would. like be, everybody in the state <laughs> would gather around to listen to see what hugs tony and jay would say uh, on that two hour uh show at kegler's people would travel from out of town and reserve a table so it really is just his impact on this community this program and it, it was a hell of a career it was a hell of a career i mean as for him to do it as long as he did it um 
happy for you. Love you, my friend. And uh, cheers to a heck of a heck of a run, man. Yeah. Thank you for everything, Jay. Thanks for coming on the show in the summer too. Yep. Uh, I know it ended a little weird, obviously with everything that happened this summer, but Hey, you're, you're, you are the definition of Mountaineer Nation and we, we owe a debt of gratitude towards you and just thank you for, for everything, Jay. And thank you for your support of the show. Um, of course as well, uh, before we get to our special guest and our last segment of the day, the Ryan and Russ show is also brought to you by 1111 media. If you run a small business and want to get more customers, talk to the local marketing experts at 1111 media, visit 11 11 dot media. That's one, one dash one, one dot media to learn more and get a free strategy session for helping your business. 1111 media helping small businesses get more customers. And you see that beautiful Ryan and Rush com at the bottom there. Go check out our website. Uh, working on getting a team of bloggers together. Of course, that's that, there's that nice little donation tab at the top if you feel so inclined. Obviously, we appreciate the likes, the subscriptions, and everything um, that goes along with that, the sharing. So, of course, that that's fantastic. And we, could, we wouldn't be here without you all. So, thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, welcome me on a special guest uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, the official BYU insider for the Ryan and Rush show. I guess uh, we lost a bet here, and uh, he, we said we'd come on the show. So <laughs> welcome, everyone. My dad, as everyone knows, I grew up a BYU fan from Provo. Mason Bishop joins the show to talk about uh, this BYU win, where the season goes from here, and probably to, to rag a little bit. How are you doing, Dad? Hey, guys. I might add, I think I might be the original investor in the Ryan and Rush show, if you remember correctly, too, Rush. So, uh, you, know. you, might, you might have been. You, you've been a very supportive uh, dad, and, and, and we, of course, appreciate it. But, hey, welcome to the Big 12, Pops. Uh, it was great that West Virginia got the football win the day I got married. We couldn't go to that game. Yeah, it was we don't my need fault. to talk about that. Yeah, disaster. so it, and then we went to the Fed, <laughs> and then we went to the FedEx Field game, so... And the series, I'm, I'm still leading 2-1. You guys might own the basketball because, of course, yeah. in every Mormon church, there's a basketball court. So yes. got that advantage working for you there. But it was a great game on Saturday, um, a close one. Obviously, we talked about the score wasn't an indication. Kind of from the BYU side of things, and especially as the rest of the Big 12 is getting to know uh, these four teams that are that are coming in and kind of the new shakeup. Obviously, it'll be shaken up again um, next year. Your thoughts on BYU transitioning into the Big 12 and, and how they're doing? Well, first, um, it's so exciting. I got to be honest, I'm really into college basketball again. Um, there's something about being in a conference like the Big 12 versus the WCC or even the old Mountain West. I mean, when I went to school, it was the old uh, Western Athletic Conference days when, you know, Michael Smith and we were playing Wyoming and Fennis Dembo and Lechner and those guys and the Merritt Center would be filled with 20,000 people or more. And it was crazy. And I feel like things kind of been down, frankly, in basketball for BYU the last few years. And uh, it's just been really exciting. And I, 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 I love watching all the games. I, I was telling Rush uh, over the weekend, Ryan, that I watch, I was watching Texas and TCU and, you know, yeah. been watching all the Big 12. I'm interested, interested in the Big 12 now as I am in BYU basketball. And I just have to be – I'll add to what I – think you guys stated I think uh, WVU has a strong future ahead I know you've had some really rough patches um, I would say in terms of the game the thing that's been most exciting for me in the last two to three games really since the Houston game that BYU played is they got too far in love with the three-point shot and actually I know they were 13 for 36 and that's a good percentage but if you really looked during the game they actually were underperforming from the three point line until probably the last half of the second half they were under 30% at one point I was looking up on the scoreboard and so um I noticed that uh really I think starting with the Houston game they've stopped just kind of jacking up threes just even if they had the chance and i notice you you'll notice they did a lot of pump fakes from the three point line and then pass to another guy the other big difference i've seen with BYU is on the drives it, it was always drive and kick drive and kick drive and kick and starting i think really the Houston game but especially in the Texas game and now the WVU game they really went to the hoop pretty hard and they're they're playing a much stronger i think which then i think gives teams a really hard time because all of a sudden you're out overplaying the three-point line. And I think that's what happened to WVU. Because then on top of it with Khalifa being ill, they had Traore. And they play more of a four-on-one, a four-out 
one with a post when he, Traore's in the game versus Khalifa, where they play more of a straight five out. And his Traore's like, he's not much taller than me. I'm 6'3", and, you know, I stood next to him in that post-game conference. I think he's 6'6", but he's a short 6'6", I got to be honest, <laughs> I think. And, you know, he, but, you know, he's able to, with his wide body to really get some space. He's got that nice little jump hook, soft jump hook. And it really presents, uh, I think, problems for teams if all of a sudden now they got a little bit of a post game and then they, they're having to guard the three-point line and the paint both. So I'm excited for BYU going forward. I, I'm excited for the tournament. Um, I, think, I, I think the most exciting thing for me, I was telling Rush, that with the Big 12 where every game is tough, that's the most amazing thing to me I'm learning watching the Big 12 really for the first time is how every game is hard. And if you go 500, you've had a successful regular season. I mean, really, you know, and, um, and and I think that preparation now when BYU gets to the March Madness tournament, I think they really present problems for a lot of teams. And I'm really excited. I think, you know, if they get a four or five seed, I think they absolutely can get to the sweet 16. And who knows what happens after that? It depends on the matchups, as you know. Yeah, c- completely agree. And th- it's that's what uh, I don't know if you heard the comparison I made, like Iowa State with the mayor's teams mm-hmm. with George Niang, like a four man that that could that that presented uh, matchup problems and they would spread them around with shooters. They had a big inside, a lot of four out one in. But uh, Mason, what's your thoughts on Mark Pope? I, is, year number five here. He, he did a good job at Utah Valley before he came over. Mm-hmm. He took over for BYU legend uh, Dave Rhodes as well. Mm-hmm. Hey, I mean, the fan base, I think, has got to be happy with the job he's doing from uh, transitioning over from the WCC to the Big 12, right? I think that's right. I think that, uh, especially coming from Utah Valley, he was very successful down there. And really, I mean, when I was at BYU, Utah Valley was a community college. It was called Utah Tech. Um, And over the decades, they became a four year. And now they're actually uh, they used to be kind of a joke in sports. And now they're they're quite good. They're almost like BYU light. Right. (laughs) Um, And so um, I think Pope's done a great job. Now, I will say I was a little bit just privately critical of Pope with especially the Texas Tech and even the Baylor game, because I felt like in both those games, BYU came out with a game plan. First half went well. And then they didn't make the adjustments. They didn't adjust to Baylor and Texas Tech's adjustments and hence lost games they probably should have won. But I got to give Pope a lot of credit because, like I say, I think what's happened, I see it. I definitely, especially now seeing it live, see a difference that Pope has done where he's made an adjustment to where um, he's telling the guys, we're not just shooting any three anymore. And I think there was a little bit of that earlier in the season. Just get up the court, shoot threes. We'll we'll win by overshooting from the three point line. It was interesting in his post game conference. I, I think two philosophies I picked up on that he spoke about is one, his philosophy is one to extend the court so that you have to guard a larger square footage of the front court, BYU's front court, and and the opponent's back court. But then the other thing I noticed he said is that. They do pass up bad two-point shots for three-point shots. Um, They either want to take a really good two-point shot like Traore down low, or they want to take a three. They don't want to take a lot of like forced two-pointers. And I would say, I think if I had one criticism of WVU and watching them live is I think their shot selection got a little shoddy at times. They they hurried shots or didn't take quality two-point shots Hence, they end up losing from the three-point line and and lose the game overall. Yeah, that's been one of our concerns with West Virginia is sometimes they get into a little bit of this panic mode and then they kind of make it like a pickup basketball game, right? Where you're just, you know, you're just kind of shooting to shoot and it becomes more of these five individuals out there rather than, you know, with the team. Uh, and, And I think BYU and how they played was a great example of that making that extra pass and a lot of that i'm sure comes with maturity mm-hmm. and, and and finding their place where do you see dad byu going like gun to your head where do you see him going the rest of this season how do you see it playing out well they play oklahoma tomorrow uh that will be a tough game to win again on the road you're lucky to win anything on the road right i mean uh, frankly what's helpful with byu beating wvu on the road it makes up for their home loss to cincinnati frankly the first game of the season Mm -hmm. so i feel like that's now kind of the the trade-off for that loss um i hold out a lot of hope this month because if you look at their schedule after being on the road they then have kansas state and oklahoma state or right now at least are at the bottom of the league those could potentially be two wins 
Um, and then I think going forward, by the end of February, they could be at 500 or above 500, I think. Um, and like you guys are saying, I was when you were talking about the tournament seeding, 11 through 14 play the extra game to get down to 12. And then obviously the four get the top four get that extra that yeah. second buy, and then five mm -hmm. will play 12, you know, and then get down yeah. to eight. And so, yeah, um, obviously, I don't think BYU will be in the top four, but I could see them maybe being the six, seven, yeah. five, maybe even if lucky. So you'd have to win what you'd have to win four games in, in four nights rather than potentially five. Like if you're in that 11 to yeah. 14. Range. Yeah. You really don't want to be in that 11 to 14. It's no. pretty hard to do, no. but you know, again, looking at the standings, yeah. um, you guys are only like a game out of maybe being in the 10. That's why this BYU game was so important to you us. Know? It really was. I, yeah. I mean, but you never know. You, you may do what BYU did where you got a road win, make up for a home loss. Maybe you guys get a road win somewhere down the line um, that, that maybe you can pick off somebody, but I think you have a good team again, Josh. I, I really was very appreciative of Mark Pope getting back to coach Pope. Uh, he gave a, I thought a, a pretty important endorsement to mm -hmm. coach Josh um, at the end of his press conference and said, you know, for what he's gone through, he's done a heck of a job and deserves a lot of credit. And I think sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that when you're, you have a little bit of turmoil going on in your program. And sometimes the best coaches are the ones that keep stability, keep, keep you competitive. And let's be honest too, BYU, frankly, was probably one lucky bank shot away from maybe losing that game. Yeah. You know? yes. Because yep. it was up seven. You guys had all the momentum. The the Coliseum got really loud. I got to be honest. My head was in my hands, and I was like, oh, no, this is going to be Texas. <laughs> I was really worried this was Texas Tech part two. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when there was two seconds, and the interesting thing, if you remember, it was only 1.1, and they went over to the monitor and gave BYU two, and then Saunders, and that was a fadeaway three on top of it, and banked it in. That was the difference. And then Nell came down and made that three when he got fouled. And and that those two plays were, you know, that was that was BYU holding off that run that WBU yeah. was on. And if that bank shot hadn't gone in, or if you'd had a shot clock violation, I think you guys might have won that game actually. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Macy, let me ask you this. Uh, so we talk about how fourteen. So Oklahoma, Texas out, but now comes in. Blue blood uh, Arizona, who's another going to be a juggernaut. Yeah. Arizona State, they're always talented. Colorado, they're going to probably be an NCAA tournament team. And then BYU's favorite, the Utah U Tour. Yeah. Yeah. Talk crap. Tourney team as well. So potentially oh, man, you're going to so lose fun. two tourney teams, but I think we're adding three more from this year. I mean, first off, this is the future of this league. And then second, how fired up are uh, BYU fans to play Utah every single Oh, year? I think it's great. Although we lost, and they were the one game we lost yeah, pre-12. I, <laughs> I was like, yeah. it's lose all, to anybody, it's them. Um, you know, I, I was telling Russia over the weekend, it's interesting. You know, Utah fans have gotten really – they're a pain in the butt. Um, they're going to be the <laughs> new Texas fans. They're, they're going to replace the Texas just, fans without Well, the here's the thing. When I was at BYU in the 80s and 90s, like Utah sports was terrible. I mean, especially football. They had, I mean, it was like BYU crushed them you know, yeah. every year in football. And then all of a sudden, you know, with Whittingham, they get good and all of a sudden they get arrogant about it. And then they're, you know, and, and, and what's really great about it for at least a brief moment of, in time has been that, you know, the Utah fans were so high and mighty about going to the PAC 12 while we were sort of struggling as an independent, I wouldn't say struggling. I mean, we have a national following. I think being independent was the right way to go in football, but you know, we were in the WCC for basketball, which not a bad conference. It was a good place for us to be with Gonzaga and St. Mary's and some of those teams, uh, given the circumstances. But then, you know, in the PAC 12, you know, with all this reshuffling and we get the, finally get the big 12 invite, we really thought we were going to get, you know, three or, well, I guess it was what pre COVID and Iowa state and some other teams vote kept voted us from getting in. Um, and I think finally getting our due and getting into the big 12 and then um, Utah not having a home and kind of, you know, <laughs> trying to play like, you know, they were going to play hard to get getting into the big 12 when it was the reality is they're kind of lucky that the big 12 was willing to take them in my opinion. So it's kind of, yeah. as a BYU fan, it's a little, little bit of turnaround is fair play. So, but in terms of basketball, um, again, I love the big 12 this year. I love it even more for next year. I think having some additional Western teams, now you've got an amazing sort of West, Midwest to East kind of, it'll be interesting to see how they schedule because you could really maybe play, two, I was telling Rush, maybe you play 
two games against like if you're BYU against teams in the West and then play one game against the teams like West Virginia and others that are in the East and vice versa. But it'll be a lot of fun. And frankly, it's going to be a lot of fun in football too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, a fun it's really, league. yeah. The umbrella, the big 12s becoming, especially if the ACC folds here, like we all think in a couple of years, you could really see kind of the old big East in one part, the big 12, the Midwest, and then the old whack together. So I'm really glad BYU's in with Arizona again. And obviously Utah getting the Holy war back. But let me let me ask you, Dad. BYU fans and and team the teams have been incredible. I, I think the Big Twelve has been very appreciative of BYU coming in and just how humble and the the gratitude that they show towards these other fan bases. Right, these home games they're serving hot chocolate and brownies to to the away <laughs> fans, right? Because yeah. no alcohol is allowed in there. So yeah, right. hey, we'll at least we'll at least give you some dessert, right? But even the even though we didn't make the game, the the football one. They ran out on the field with the state of West Virginia flag, the yeah. fans and them stayed around for country roads. Um, you know, we mom met that guy in the lobby this weekend that just said, Hey, I found a place in my heart for, for BYU with how great the, the, the fans are and how well they just treat us. And I think the big 12 is really appreciative for a school like BYU to come in and kind of be humble, especially with a school like, you know, Texas leaving. And we, you know, there's a couple others in there that think they're, they're mightier than they really are. You know, we'll see it next year with Utah coming in. But kind of just from the fan base perspective, what is just being in the Big 12 mean for BYU? I, I think it means a lot for the fans. I think this was a long time coming, especially starting with realignments, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, again, you know, BYU sort of dominated in the old whack days, especially in football. Um, and then, um, you know, the Mountain West came around and that was okay. But then it really got to a point for a long time, I think really until this year, BYU has really not had a home from in terms of a conference, given its size. A lot of people don't realize how big a school BYU is. Yeah, It's like 30,000. I mean, it's the largest private university in the country. Um, it's it's big. It's not a small little 8,000 person. I mean, when you go to B, the Marriott Center where BYU plays basketball, most people don't realize it used to be. I think it still is. It was the second largest on-campus uh, arena in the country behind the Carrier Dome. I mean... I, I know the other night they announced full house at 18,000, but I can tell you when I, it used to be like 26,000 was, was, I mean, it was a lot of people it would fit in the Marriott center and you know, the football stadium, 65, 66,000. So it's, it's a large university and we really haven't had a home for quite a long time in terms of sports, given our size and our ability to recruit nationally and have a fan, a national fan base. And so I think come the Big 12, uh, I get to meet the the gentleman. His name was John in the hotel as well. And he literally was like, listen, BYU, he did. He said to me too, BYU has a special place in my heart. I was there for the football game and you guys got killed. And he goes, most fans, they leave and the teams, you know, rightfully so kind of are disappointed and they'll walk off the field. He goes, no, your players and your fan, the fans didn't leave. And the players joined in with the West Virginia players and saying country roads. And he goes, I will never forget that for as long as I live. And he goes, I've never seen anything like that. And so that, that means a lot to me as a BYU fan that we, we show up that way. And, you know, culturally, I'll be honest, I think we uh, Mormons tend to want to be accepted. And so, you know, I think we tend to go the extra mile to try to show charity and love for, for people and, and uh, try to try to be our brother's keeper, so to speak. Uh, you know, at least that's what we try to strive for as individuals. And I think that shows up in our sports programs. You know, again, sports is different for BYU. It's not just about athletics. Sports is about showcasing what we are as a church and as a people. And so um, we try to espouse the kind of values that we try to live even through our sports programs. And so I think hopefully you're seeing a little bit of that with us joining the Big 12. Oh yeah, it 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 definitely shows. I, I you talk to everyone around here; they're they're so happy um, that that you all are in. It, trust me, with what, what some of these teams, like we were saying earlier, with uh, Texas horns down, uh, getting a team like BYU in the Big Twelve is is very refreshing. I actually have a pen over there. I got someone gave it to me as a gift after because uh, we missed the football game, obviously. And there was there was um, I guess it was a lady handing out these pins that were, it's like a West Virginia versus BYU foot here. I'll grab it real quick. It was, they're like, uh, if you can see that. Oh yeah. Yeah. She was That's like handing yeah. these out and it was from, I guess, BYU TV. You can see made these. And then they talked about the Mountaineer. It was just not like, it, it's just incredible fans and in, in what they do. But 
Dad, we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks, guys. uh, It's a lot of fun. You know, hey, everybody, watch the Ryan and Rush show. We watch it uh, all the time. Um, I will uh, flip on the show and stick my phone in my pocket and put my earbuds in and go for my evening run sometimes or something. There you go. So there you go. Well, we appreciate the the support on multiple levels, Dad. And then, when, of course, when we get uh, closer to the Big 12 tournament and and we're talking about, like, seems a lot more, we'll have you back on. We also got the college experience um as well of course so again dad thank you so much it was an awesome Thanks, weekend guys. we had together and we appreciate your your expertise so thank you pops good appreciate night it. See thanks Mason. all right everyone that concludes another edition of the ryan and rush show we will be back on wednesday this week obviously the mountaineers are off so we're, we're going to take a bye day ourselves we'll preview the texas game on wednesday and kind of talk about the standings coming up uh, in the Big 12 and, and do a well-rounded picture there. Don't forget to also follow us on the college experience, the Big 12 college experience, where we're joined by our friend Troy. And, you know, look at the more gambling side of things if you're into that. So anyway, we love you all. We appreciate the support. We'll see you on Wednesday. And, of course, you can always find us on social media. Let's go Mountaineers. See you guys. Let's go Mountaineers.